praise him. So good to be in his house. So good to be together. Amen. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made and we will be glad and rejoice in it. How many would say amen? You know, there is nothing like an original. And what's so awesome about our God is that he only creates originals. And he works with originals. Amen? Each and every person here is an original. Formed in your mother's womb. Known before the foundations of the earth. Every facet of your personality, every uh, uh, degree and ounce of gifting, it all came from God. You are an original. Amen? And each original here was formed with a very beautiful, purposeful, and specific plan. God doesn't make mistakes. How many would say amen? Amen. And so today we're starting a series called The Original Plan. And we live in a world that's always changing and always shifting, always running towards the new thing. But I want to suggest we need to focus on the original plan that God had. As believers, we need to be anchored in God's original plan for our lives. So we've got a lot to do, always in the introduction of a series. There's so much to cover. Plus, we're taking communion, and it's going to be a really powerful time in the presence of the Lord. So we're going to go right to chapter 1, book 1, the book of Genesis. Turn to chapter 1, book 1, and we're going to jump right into the sixth day of creation. We know that the world was created Uh, Over the course of six days, on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. But on the sixth day, he began to work on his crowning achievement. And one of the things you're going to see from the very beginning, once I turn to this text and put it up, one of the things you're going to see immediately is that right out of the chute, we learn that God is three in one. And right out of the chute, we see that God always had a plan by the end of this this message, despite what the devil did. I want to declare to you that God always had a plan. Regardless of how he got in and regardless of the twists and turns and the works, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Christ came that we might have life and life to the full. How many want life to the full? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's, let's go ahead and read. And I want to encourage you to read Genesis uh, chapter 1 through chapter 3. The story really ends fundamentally at, uh, um, at Genesis 3.15. We'll end the message with this. But let's go ahead and throw up uh, Genesis chapter 1. Do we have it here? It's there, but it's stuck, I guess. Okay, I'll just read it from my Bible here. Don't you love when technology... Hallelujah. Come on. Though it tarry, it will come, the Bible says. Okay, so remember all of, the, all of the, the stars, the moon, the sun, the stars, the mountain, the oceans, the seas, the animals, everything was created. And now God's crowning achievement, mankind. And here's what the Bible says. Then God said, let us... Make mankind in our image. Notice plural. In the book of Genesis, God's name is uh, Elohim. Elohim is uniqueness because it's kind of God in plural. Now, it doesn't mean that there are many, many gods as there are other religions would, would espouse. But what it means is that our God is unique. He is three in one. So from the very beginning, you see God revealing his triune nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God, now watch this. 
It says, so God created mankind in his own image. One. In the image of God, he created them. Two. Male and female, he created them. So here's another thing. The sermon is not about this. But for anyone that ever wonders, why does the Bible teach that marriage is between a man and a wife? A man and a woman. It's because our sexuality is sacred to God because our sexuality is tied directly to the image of God and the plan of God. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And if I could just say, just this is not what the sermon is about, but if I could just say, always remember, God is right and we are wrong. His ways are better than our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. God loves everyone. He's never mean. He's never mean. He's always good. But his standards, his ways are the best ways. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's keep on going. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. One more time, he says, rule over, oh, no, I'm sorry, be fruitful and increase. Some translations say be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The original plan of God from the very beginning was that we as his children would be fruitful and that we would multiply. God wants you to be a fruitful person. God wants you to be the kind of person that initiates and instigates kingdom multiplication and expansion. It is God's will for us to be a fruitful people. How many believe that today? Now, fruitful means a couple of key things. We're going to pray in a moment, but fruitful means a couple of key uh, things. The original plan of God was that we would be fruitful and multiply, and here's how. Number one, that we would fill the earth with our families to honor his kingdom. Your family is very important to God. Our families are very important to God. It was God's will that our families would be blessed and fruitful and that we would fill the earth. Wherever there are people, God wants people, his people to be there to reveal him, to show how good he is. Has God been good to anyone in this last week and last year? We're supposed to share it everywhere we go. And it begins with our homes. It begins with our families. God wants to bless your home in 2020. God wants to put a blessing on your home. Even you, if you're a single person, let me tell you something. God wants to bless your home. He wants to make you fruitful. And he wants to make you an agent of kingdom multiplication and expansion. This is the original plan. Secondly, is that we would be fruitful in all of our living as agents of multiplication and expansion. Not meaning that just we just have a blessed family and a blessed home, but that everything that we do, there would be a sense of blessing on it. And that we would be blessed, not so that we'll have a lot, but so that people will say, why are you so blessed? And we could say, because our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah. That's why. I don't get the credit. He gets the credit for every good thing in my life. In other words, it makes sense that so many great uh, universities and teaching institutions, it makes sense that so many hospitals were started by Christians or Christian organizations because we're supposed to bless and multiply. 
it makes sense that when you look throughout hi history, there are so many Christian inventors and Christian business people who did amazing things. It makes sense that they would be blessed. It makes sense that as Christians, we give so much to the world. It makes sense that we impact communities by giving, by, by providing a community center, by, by sending our kids off to, off to camp every time you sponsor a young person. It makes sense because he said, be fruitful and multiply. It makes sense because that was the plan from the very beginning. God blesses us so that we could be like him. And he wants us to be agents of kingdom multiplication. And here's how it begins. You know what the Bible teaches us here is that being fruitful and being an agent of multiplication and expansion, it all begins with the image of God. And the title of the message today is the original image. Now what we're going to be looking at and what we're going to pray about right now is the incredible tension that stands between our culture, which is all about self and self-image, and the original plan, which is all about the image of Christ. And if we will just focus on the image of God, we will be transformed and we will be blessed. How many know it's better to look like him than look like you? I don't want to look like me. I want to look like him. How many would say amen? So let's pray about this as we look down the road of 2020. Let's pray about the original plan being released in the totality of its purpose and power in our lives. We had a powerful time of prayer in the office today. And we prayed it for ourselves. We said, Lord, we want to be incredible image bearers of Jesus. That's what really counts. And as we bear the image of Christ wherever we go, and we're going to unpack this in the next few moments, as we do that, he gets the glory, and we get to see the blessing of God upon us and flow through us to other people. So let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this amazing service. Lord, we've been in your presence together, and we've been worshiping you and honoring you, and now, God, we ask your blessing upon your word. And Lord, I pray that your word will penetrate deeply. I pray that your word would tear down the lies, O oh God, of self-focus, and that we would become God-focused. I pray that you would release your people, O oh God, to surrender to your plan and that we would all give up our plans. Your ways are better than our ways. And so we choose that and we receive that. Bless this word, bless our time together. In the mighty name of Jesus and everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So it's the... It's through the image of God that we were meant to be fruitful. It's through the image of God that we were meant to be agents of multiplication, like walk in a room and share Jesus, and then the blessing that we have spills over to other people. They're like, oh, my goodness, what is it? Why do you have this? Why do you have that sense of peace? Why do you have that light and that joy? It's because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. May the image of Jesus shine in 2020. Amen? Amen. And so the original plan, listen, the original plan, which was through the image of God, it was the best plan. The original plan was the healthiest plan for you and me. The original plan was the holiest plan. And it is right. And even though sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve, even though there was a breakdown, that original plan was not canceled. Okay? The original plan was not canceled. And that plan was that it would all be through our image. 
So I just want to say this. If you're here and you're in business or you're in school and you're really trying to get ahead and you really want to be successful, I think this truth of the original plan that we would bear the image of God can really help you in judging whether success or progress is right in your life. So if our success or progress does not bear the image of God, it's not God's original plan. Meaning that you could be making a lot of money, you could be very successful, you can be accumulating a lot of trinkets and treasures, but in the process, if we're not bearing the image of God, it's really not God's plan. Amen. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for that. Support and encouragement, brothers and sisters, I feel. But it's true. Because he does want to bless us, but he wants to bless us as we bear his image. We were created to be in the image of God. And here's what that fundamentally means. We're like God in three ways. First of all, we are all spiritual. Even though you have a flesh, at the root of your being, you have a spirit. When our body dies, our spirit lives on. God is a spirit, the Bible says, and we are all spiritual, and our spirit is actually eternal. We're going to spend eternity someplace. You see? And first and foremost, we are spiritual beings, and we need to remember that there's more to life than taste and touch and feel. Because God is spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Number two, we are moral. God <clears throat> is not only spirit, but God is holy. And our morality counts. We are morally responsible for our actions. Why? Because we're like God. The animals are not morally responsible. Okay, the trees and the vegetation, they are not morally responsible. They are created beings. They are alive, but they were not created in the image of God. We were created in the image of God, and as people that were created in the image of God, holiness is important. His will, his word, his ways are important, and we are called to honor the word of God. Could somebody say amen to that? And so we do have a moral responsibility in this life. And what we do with our lives does matter. It matters to God. Lastly, we are like God because we are relational. God is love. And relationships are of primary importance to the Christian. God is love. Everybody say God is love. God is love, and when we, uh, uh, as his children, when we receive him and we have Christ in us, we're supposed to be like God. And we're going to unpack this some more in a moment. But God is love, and so our relationships our, are, are very important to God, beginning with family. The way we live with other people is really important to God because we're supposed to be agents of the love of God. And we're going to kind of, we'll be wrapping this message up with that. But we're really like God. Now, after the fall, the plan of God included that we had to be saved because we know that as the story unfolds, Adam and Eve, they fell, they sinned. And they brought separation. What does sin do? Sin brings separation in our relationship with God. And then it breaks the flow of God that makes us actually like God. You see? But we know that God had a plan. And that's why we're celebrating communion today. Jesus went to the cross. And he paid the price for our sin so that we would be declared not guilty and we could have relationship with Jesus once again with God. How many are thankful that we have relationship with God? And so this is, think of, think of, think of the very, very important verse, okay? Because there's a process going on in your life and in my life. And that process is the process of our being conformed into the image of God. Look at what Romans says 
about this. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, everybody say all things. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Anybody here love Jesus? Hallelujah. If you love Jesus, even good times and bad times and hard days and difficult days and even our own failures and our own weaknesses, God uses all of those things to work together for our good. Okay, and then look at this. It says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. And from the very beginning, it was his plan. He predestined that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That's the original plan. What is God doing in your life? Sometimes you're like, God, what are you doing in, your, in my life? And you're, you're, you're saying, God, what are you doing in my life from, perspective, from the perspective of your career? Or, or from your, what you're doing in ministry, or what you're going to, or who you're going to marry. God, what are you doing in my life? And I'm telling you right now, the most overarching, most important thing that God is doing in our lives is he is trying to conform us into the image of Jesus. We are never better than when we become like Jesus. That's the plan. It's the best plan. It's the healthiest plan. It's the holiest plan. That's what he's doing. He's growing us and he's transforming us into his image. I got to keep moving here because we need time for communion. But fundamentally speaking, when you think about your image, okay, when you think about this culture, we're living in a culture that is obsessed with self-image. And we even try to raise our kids making sure that they have a healthy self-image. Self-image this, self-image that, self-image this, self-image that. We, it goes on and on and on. And we're constantly talking about self-image. When you think about self-image, what it really has translated uh, to now is kind of like our appearance before people. You know, I remember talking to a kid, uh, a young man I really, really love, and he said to me, you know, I can't stop thinking about what people think about me. I can't stop thinking about it. Every time I walk into a room, all I think about is what people are thinking about me. What has happened in our culture is appearances is, is everything. And, you know, it's so funny when you look at Instagram. And I know this is a lot of people. This, what I'm going to say is played out, but I'm going to say it again. Okay? So, have you noticed that no one posts their bad hair days? <laughs> you know? Have you noticed that people only post the things that look like a postcard and everything that looks fantastic, you know? But, but, but that's just, that's not real life. This thing has become so powerful in our culture that our preteens are being, they're criticizing themselves because they're saying, I don't have the life that that person has. Okay, and people are putting themselves down. Part of the reason, I just read an article that, you know what the leading cause of, of, um, of death in, in males in London is suicide. Why? Because appearances and achievements and status, we want the status symbols. And we put so much energy into that. And I'm telling you right now, you will never be whole. You'll never be healthy. The key to being whole and healthy and, and fruitful and being an agent of expansion is to get close to Jesus. You know, when I think about this particular issue, and then I'm, we're going to two points, but I think about uh, learning how to play golf. Learning how, you know, I grew up playing sports. I was a pretty good athlete. But let me tell you, golf is so hard. And I don't even know how it's hard because I used to hit guys through 85 miles an hour. I got base hits or whatever if I got like that. Now the ball doesn't even move. It's the most difficult thing. 
you got to be kidding me. I remember saying, come on, how difficult could this be? Just hit the ball straight. No. And so here's the interesting thing. There are what's natural in most sports to swinging and all that kind of stuff. With golf, it's different. Like when I first started learning, my friends would say, this is counterintuitive. You don't swing at a golf ball like you swing a baseball bat. You don't do it like this. You don't do There's all of these ways. It's just different. And can I tell you something? What I'm talking about is the same kind of issue. It's just different. There's self-help books. There's all of these plans. There's all of these personal development plans and all of this. And fine, go for it. But let me tell you something. Without closeness to Jesus, we will never become who we were meant to be. <laughs> That's why we sing, we want you more and more. We want you more and more. We want you more and more. It was all because God knows the more we're like him, the, the better things are and the better we are for his glory. I was, I played catch with my oldest grandson, Wesley, for about an hour and at least an hour in my house. I sat on the couch and I was throwing him a ball, and he was catching it and throwing it, and I was, I was just celebrating for an hour. Think about this for a moment. So we have children, we have grandchildren, and when they do things that we love, when they do things that are like us, we get so excited. You know, we understand it, we love it, and, and it just, it's so, you know, he was like fielding the ball. I got like four videos, if you don't believe me, I got them right there in the front. <laughs> throw the ball, he's throwing the ball. He's like, way to throw, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and um, we get so excited with our kids. But, you know, can I tell you something? As wonderful as those moments are, the most wonderful moment for us should always be when our children and our grandchildren actually act like Jesus. Could somebody say amen? And their life will never be better. They'll never be more protected. The angels of heaven will stand guard over their lives. Hallelujah, Jesus, when they act like Jesus. And so this is so important for us. The original plan is that we would be close enough to God to be like God. And here's what I want to, I want to give two quick ac application points and then we'll take communion. Number one, it is through the image of God that we can be at peace with ourselves. They could send one of the keyboard players. It's through his image, it's in his image that we can be at peace with ourselves. And it's God's will for you and I to live and walk in peace. You ever talk to someone who has everything and in a sense it seems like they have nothing because they have no peace? Come on, everybody at least one time in your life you had to come across that, right? And for so many years at times we think, man, if I wish I had that and I wish I had this and I wish I achieved this and I wish I achieved that. And the truth of the matter is, is that if we have no peace, we have nothing. But the Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. It's God's will. Before you could be a blessing to someone else, you have to be at peace with yourself. And here's what Ravi Zacharias said, okay? When you, are, you and I are told that we're made in the image of God, the implication is very obvious. You are made with intrinsic worth. How many know every person here is valuable, valuable, valuable to Jesus? You see? And so our kids, our children, and we need to tell this world, there's someone that you work with that feels worthless. There's someone that, you, I just read an article of, of a Chicago Bulls player, Ben Gordon, who was constantly thinking about suicide. Because his, his uh, basketball career was over. 
Well, I've got news for you, my brother. You were loved before you ever bounced a basketball. You were created, hallelujah, in the image of the Most High God. And there is a powerful peace that he wants every single one of us to walk in. The peace that comes from knowing that he loves us with an everlasting love. He loved us enough to die for us. He wants to be close to us. He wants to live inside of us. Hallelujah. We are children of peace. In this life, we are called not to live in worry, not to live in doubt. We're called to live in peace. We're children of God. We've been made in the image of God. Hallelujah. Come on, praise God right now. Hallelujah. It's God's will that we would live in peace. And the closer you get to God, see, the closer you and I get to God, the more our hearts start to just rest. And then when we walk out into this world, we become the best version of ourselves. You know, I... I uh, I grew up in a day when Whitney Houston was a star. If you don't know who Whitney Houston is, she could really sing. Google it or whatever they do. And um, Whitney Houston, Houston once said, this is a paraphrase. She once said, you know, just because you're famous doesn't mean that you're well. Just because you're famous doesn't mean that you're well. And when we look at the Bible, one of the, one of the greatest burdens on the heart of God has to be that your heart would be well. Forget about anything that you do for God. Do you realize God loves you so much he wants you to be at peace? He wants you to be whole? Just you, just right here, right now. Not doing anything. Not accomplishing anything. Maybe your father put you down. Maybe your mother put you down. Maybe you were abandoned. Maybe people put you down. That wasn't the original plan. In the name of Jesus, you're stepping into the original plan. You are a child of God. You're an image bearer of God. And first and foremost, you and I are called to peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. People can't figure out the peace of the believer because you can't find it on earth. Only Jesus can give it. He's the Prince of Peace. And so, as image bearers, we're called to walk in everyone peace. Secondly, in his image, it's when we're in his image that we actually can give of ourselves. Okay? God has called each one of us to be so whole, to be so healthy, that we are not dividers. The Bible says multiply, don't divide. We're going to talk about that next week. We're supposed to bear fruit. We're supposed to be generous. We're supposed to give away. Why? Because that's the kind of God that we serve. You see? And so in his image, we can give of ourselves. You are valuable and God desires for you to be like him. Well, look at what the Bible says about God. We're almost done here. It says, dear friends, let us, everyone, Love one another. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because everyone, God is love. Say it with me. God is love. One more time. God is love. And so as image bearers, we're supposed to be people who can give. We're supposed to be people who can love. 
We're supposed to be people not who are always thinking about ourselves and hoarding and, and competing and, 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 and looking at what they have and being jealous. No, we celebrate what God gives them because we're whole. We want them to be better. Hallelujah. We want them to be better. We want them to be blessed. And we know that perfect love casts out all fear. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this week coming up. People are struggling, battling, and you know what they need? They need love to come out of us. And when love comes out of us, then we're bearing the image of our Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, I told Pastor Dave, I wish I had an hour and like 30 minutes to preach today. But I don't. I want you to think about this and pray about this and, and meditate on this. We're going to spend five or six weeks talking about this, different facets of this. But here's the last thing as we go to take communion. This is very, very important. Okay? In his image, this is the biggie. In, read this with me. Ready? In his image, we have no shame. See, you can't be fruitful. You cannot multiply as long as shame is, is crowding your life. It's not God's will for us to walk in shame. To be ashamed is to be the opposite of what God wants us to be. You see, in his image image we have no shame God sent his son Jesus to wash away all the guilt and shame look at what Bonhoeffer said about this he says shame is overcome only through the restoration of fellowship with God and man and men in, man sh in shame, man is reminded of his disunion with God and other men. It is God's will for us to be close to him and restored to him so that we could be at peace, so that we could love. And part of the reason why Jesus came to this earth and died, in other words, let me put it this way. The legal outcome of the cross was that you and I would be declared not guilty. The practical outcome of the cross is that today as we go to take communion, you would walk out of this place with, with absolutely no shame. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No shame. Totally clean. Totally forgiven. Hallelujah. That's the power of the blood. God knows that when we have shame, we can't be like him. And that's why we take communion on a consistent basis. Watch this. Let's go back to the original plan and we're going to close. The Bible says in Genesis 2.25, Adam and his wife were both naked and everyone, they felt no shame. They were together. There was no shame in the original plan. Then watch this. Okay. So, uh, uh, um, in after they fell, after Adam and Eve fell, God confronts the devil. We'll just start right here. And he's speaking to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Watch this. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You know what this is? This is the first time the gospel is prophesied and declared from the very beginning. He said, you might strike my son's heel, but my son is going to crush your head, Satan. Hallelujah. He will crush your head, and my children will live in the fullness of the blessing. Hallelujah. Of their father, blessed be the name of the Lord. My children will live in the fullness and the blessing of their heavenly father. From the very beginning, even in the original plan, 
See, you talk about God wants us to be fruitful, God wants us to multiply, and then Satan could be whispering even while I'm preaching. Well, not you, because look at what you have. Look at what you have from the very beginning. He says, even though the devil tricked you, it doesn't matter because my son has crushed him. He's been defeated on the cross, hallelujah. And whom the son says free is free indeed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the will of God and the plan of God. And that's why we take communion here. And I want to end by telling you this. I, I didn't have this in my notes, but I was talking to Pastor Edgar. And so he reads a book. He's, he's got, I've been preaching with two mics, I just realized. <laughs> Thanks for telling me, guys. I was like, why do I have this in my hand? I got this thing on. Which one is working right now? Just use the mic. The die. I feel no shame right now. I just want you to know that. <laughs> so listen real quickly, and then we got to get ready to um, take communion. So Pastor Edgar was telling me, that he reads this book, it was by Max Lucado. The book is that you're special, and it's a story of a, of a little, like, toy, or a little creature of sorts, and they're almost like children. And so whenever they make a mistake, they get these gray dots, and they feel kind of embarrassed. And in their world, the more gray dots you have, the, the less valuable you are, the less dots you have, the more valuable. So this little boy runs into a little girl and she had no dots. And he says, well, how did you, why is it that you don't have any dots? And she says, well, I went to our maker. And our maker told me that when he sees me, he doesn't see any dots. And, and the dots just started to fall off. And so the little boy goes to the maker and he experiences it for himself. And the maker says, you're perfect, no dots. And then all of a sudden, the dots started to fall off. See, that's a beautiful picture of when we bring our sin to Jesus and he just washes it all away. Could somebody say amen? Could we praise God? Hallelujah, Jesus. No more dots. No more dots. It was the original plan that we would feel no guilt and no shame. Flawed, yes. Imperfect, yes. Failures uh, from time to time, yes. But hallelujah, sinners lose all their guilty shame. We lose all the guilty stain. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. I just want you to begin to think about your relationship with God. If you're a Christian here, then you want to search your heart because you want, you want God to refresh your relationship with him, to remove all. If there's sin, if there's a struggle, if there are things that you know have kind of slipped in your habits, in your choices, in your relationships, today is the day to ask for forgiveness so that you can walk out of here completely clean. Now, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, you haven't started a relationship with Jesus, can I tell you, we're going to take communion. Communion is a symbol outwardly of what Christ has done inwardly. And so even though there's a very special blessing upon what we're going to do together, it only is really powerful and pleasing to God if first we have a moment with God and say, Lord, I want you to be my cleanser, my redeemer, my savior, my master, my friend. And so the Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Jesus knocks at the door of people's hearts. He's been doing this from the moment he rose from the dead, so to speak. He has been knocking on our hearts. I gave my life to Christ on a baseball field. We all have a story. There are some people who gave their heart to, to God at an altar or in a seat in a church service, others in the park, in a, on a park bench. It doesn't matter where it is. The point is, is that right here, right now, we don't own tomorrow. We have an opportunity to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And if you're here 
and you don't have that personal relationship, but right now you feel him knocking and saying, open the door because I love you so much that I want to start that relationship with you. Is, if that's you in the privacy of this moment and you want to invite him in, would you raise your hand because it's as simple as praying a prayer. If you want to start a relationship with Jesus, is there anyone here? Just lift up your hand and, and I'm going to thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Raise your hands nice and high because we want to make sure we take note of you. Thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Is there anyone else? I want to wait a few minutes. Do you feel the Lord knocking at the door of your heart and you want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior? Blessed be your name. Okay, you can put your hand down. Let's pray right now. Everyone repeat after me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. because your forgiving grace and power are here. It's all because of what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Thank you for coming to the earth. Thank you for living a sinless life. And thank you for dying for my guilt and shame. Forgive me, Lord. Wash away all the shame. Remove all the guilt. I open up the door of my heart to you. And I invite you in. Be the king of my heart and the Lord of my life. Thank you for being my savior. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for receiving me, even as I receive you. Amen and amen. Could we put our hands together? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's praise God with the angels right now. Hallelujah for everyone who raised their hand and prayed that prayer. Congratulations. You are a child of God. You will be in heaven with him forever and ever and ever. You've received a box from us. That box is a gift from us to you. It has a Bible in it. The Bible is God's love letter and, and life book for us, guidebook for us. And there's a couple of other things to help you start your new relationship with God. If you would take a moment and fill out the card in there, we'd love to get some information and, and just connect with you. And if you have a minute, please come forward. One of the pastors would love to just talk to you for just two minutes. It would really be a blessing to us if you did that. So now that we've prayed that prayer, uh, uh, everyone here, we should be eligible to take communion together. And uh, they're going to come and they're going to uh, pass out the, the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus, and the bread, which represents his body. You're going to receive it and just hold it. But while we're doing that, this is a time to pray and to search your heart and say, Lord, have your way. Whatever shift, whatever change you want to make, Lord, if, if I've been holding a grudge. So one of the most powerful things that happens when we take communion is that God forgives us. But remember, when you want God to forgive you, you need to forgive those that you're holding something against. Jesus died for the sins that we commit, and he also died for the sins committed against us. It doesn't mean that he's belittling the hurt and the pain that we've received, but it does mean that we are releasing them and leaving all of those things to God. And I want to encourage you right now as we prepare to take communion, if there's a grudge in your heart, if, you're, if there's resentment towards someone else, just let it go because hallelujah, Jesus lets us go. We're bringing things to the light. We're bringing uh, secrets to the light. God knows all things. And we're saying, God, we turn away from that. Forgive us. We want to walk out of here free. We want to walk out of here with no shame.